way way back before most of you were even in existence there were two writers that I was particularly absorbed with one was Shakespeare and the other was Plato and in the first half of the 1930s I memorized quite a number of Shakespeare's sonnets and I discovered at Moorhead in July of this year that I could still remember them exactly and uh, so I wrote one out and read it and I discovered this evening that I could remember another one so I wrote that out and also Shakespeare was very occupied with two things one was love and the other was immortality like most sensitive writers and poets and philosophers he had this continuing problem that he could see so much that was beautiful and lovable in the world but he knew that it was all doomed to decay and to pass away and being at that time at least I would say not a Christian he wrestled in his mind and in his soul for some kind of answer or comfort or assurance and much of his wrestling comes out in his sonnets in the sonnets there was someone who was usually called the dark lady who was apparently the object of his passionate affection and it's somewhat improbable that his affection was fully requited and um, in one of his sonnets he tried to convince this lady that though she might grow old his poetry would make her immortal well I'd have to say that's a pretty unsatisfactory kind of immortality but it shows how deeply he was preoccupied with this fact that everything around us though it's so beautiful and probably nobody appreciated its beauty more than Shakespeare or expressed it more clearly it's all decaying there's another sonnet he wrote I don't remember all of it but the first four lines go like this when I consider everything that grows holds in perfection but a little moment and this huge stage presenteth naught but shows where on the stars in secret influence comment so he saw everything was growing coming to perfection and immediately starting to wither and he sensed that somewhere in the background there was some unseen influence that was causing this and typically of people's thinking even today he attributed it to the stars well here's another of his sonnets complete address to this ravishing lady and he's trying to assure her that though she may grow old she'll live forever in his sonnet and you can just judge it for yourself whether it would satisfy you shall I compare thee to a summer's day thou art more lovely and more temperate rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's lease hath all too short a date sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines and often is his gold complexion dim and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed but thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair thou owest nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest so long as men can read or eyes can see so long lives this and this gives life to thee well that's the best he could offer her the immortality of his poetry and sure enough it has lived nearly 400 years but the lady died and this one speaks about what love ought to be it's one of his most famous sonnets and again he's obviously reaching out for something he can see it ought to be there and he doesn't know where to find it he really sets a high standard for love it goes like this let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove ah no 
It is an ever-fixed mark which looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. So he had a very, very high expectation of love. And I would say he was probably disappointed. And having gone that way myself, I think I understand his disappointment. For 25 years, I looked in poetry, philosophy, the world, its pleasures, its thrills, its excitements, its intellectual challenges for something enduring and permanent and satisfying and the more I looked, the less satisfied I was. And I had no idea what I was looking for. But when the Lord revealed himself to me and baptized me in the Holy Spirit, I knew instantly that was what I had been looking for all that time. And you know what I wondered? And I don't want to be critical, but it's true. I wondered why I'd been to church for 20 years and no one had ever told me about that. So we're going to talk now about God's version of love. Not Shakespeare's, nor Plato's, but God's. I think it was in the spring camp this year here, it may be, or maybe sometime last year, I preached a message on the development of divine love. And I want to start from those scriptures and then move rapidly on to others. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, we read this tremendous statement. Romans 5, 5, Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Love maketh not ashamed, or love, a hope is never disappointed when it's fixed in the love of God. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. I understand that to be the totality of God's love. God withheld nothing. He just turned the bucket upside down and poured the whole thing in when he baptized us in the Holy Spirit. And many of us have had tremendous supernatural experiences of love. I remember when I was a soldier in the British Army, what you would call a hospital attendant. I was overseas for four and a half years in North Africa mainly and then in Palestine. And one year I spent in the Sudan, which is a dry, desert, rather bleak land. And there's nothing very attractive about the Sudan, nor about the people of the Sudan, in the natural. But I had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and God had shown me that he had a destiny for me. And I remember that God began to give me a supernatural love for those people. And the army placed me for a short while in a place called Atbara, which is a railway junction in the northern Sudan. And I was in charge of a small reception station for military patients. I think it had three beds. I was in sole charge. There was a civilian doctor in the city with whom I was in liaison, but I was my own boss for about the first time in my military career. Furthermore, I had a bed to sleep in, which was very unfamiliar. And more than that, amongst the equipment that was issued in this reception station were long white nightgowns made of flannel. And I had spent at that time about three years sleeping in my underwear and I was tired of it. So I availed myself of the facilities 
put on a long white nightgown and slept in a bed <laughs> and I remember that particular night the Spirit of God came upon me in intercessory prayer for the people of the Sudan and it had nothing to do with my natural feelings toward them at all and I could not stay in bed I was driven by this inner power and I found myself praying far above the level of anything that I could do by my own reason or emotion and somewhere in the middle of the night and I tell this with some hesitation but I was aware that my white nightgown was actually shining I somehow I was in direct union with the Lord after that the army sent me on to another place a miserable place in the Red Sea Hills where everybody else was discontented and I spent eight of the happiest months of my life because I loved the people and in that situation I had the privilege of winning to the Lord the first member of a certain tribe called the Hadandawa that had ever professed faith in Christ and when I left it broke my heart to leave that place and leave that man behind so I have experienced in some small measure the supernatural love of God and when I met my wife later about a year later in Palestine and saw the girls she was bringing up the Lord again filled my heart with this wonderful love supernatural love and at that time I really had no thought of marriage but all that didn't make me the kind of person I ought to be I was still often selfish irritable self-centered and insensitive and what I'm trying to explain to you is that a supernatural experience of the love of God is wonderful but it doesn't deal with our character and God has got to go from the supernatural outpouring of divine love to the formation of a character that adequately expresses the love of God and that's a process and it's a long process and it takes God's patience to take us through it